Nancy Pelosi yesterday held a briefing with reporters, and I asked her if she thought an election denier could succeed as speaker. Her answer was very short. She said, all I'll tell you is Republicans wanted Donald Trump to be their speaker, and they got him. Is that true? Pretty true. I mean, you've got somebody who's completely aligned. You know, he was under the radar. You know, when they filed the amicus brief, I think it was 126 of them about the, you know, election results. You're talking about somebody who really led the effort on election denialism, but he was quiet about it. So he was in the text messages that we saw in the January 6th committee, but he was only mentioned. He actually wasn't in the two from, but he was the one sending the personal correspondence saying that they had Donald Trump's back when it came to stop the steal. So it's, it's incredible where we are today. From January 6th now, almost three years later, by the way, we now have sort of a J6 election denier leadership in the GOP. And for somebody who is former GOP, it's pretty stunning. When you look at all the challenges this Congress faces, the country faces, you look at Israel aiding Ukraine, southern border, keeping the government open, how, what's his thought process well, behind... You know, when I, when I look at everything that's happening, it, every single decision that's made, if you're looking at, at Israel funding or tying IRSD funding to Israel funding, you're talking about trying to separate out Ukraine funding, all that is really about a cult of personality. It's about Donald Trump. Now, people can wrap certain arguments around it. You can say, oh, there's corruption in Ukraine. That's why we don't want to fund it. That's pretty much BS. I mean, what you're talking about is they're trying to make one man happy. They're looking at the 2024 election. And you have somebody that's running that agenda. So if you look at it through that lens, you know, a lot of people want to try to wrap policy wrappers around it. Really what it comes down to is they're just trying to make Donald Trump happy. He didn't like Ukraine. He had some issues with Zelensky, as you know. But it seems to me that a lot of these are petty and are actually based on a cult of personality rather than real policy decisions. Well, so having uh, been on the inside, what's your gut check on what's happening now? He got this bill passed that you know is DOA in the Senate. We understand uh, from leadership, even Tom Cole said the Senate bill can't pass the House uh, does, is, is Israel going to be in a situation where it's not getting the aid it needs? Is Ukraine going to be in that situation? I and think, is this all going to coincide with a government shutdown? You know, I've said for a long time that we need to have adults back in the room. And when you have people passing unserious legislation, or they're basing any of their policy arguments on fantasy or magical thinking, you get bills that are dead or DOA based on what their belief systems are rather than what's best for the United States of America. I think that's what you're seeing right now is you have unserious legislators trying to do serious business. And when you get to that point, I think the American people need to decide whether they want to keep electing these types within those districts to office or it's time to get serious and actually purge those individuals who are already in the election denialism stream. Let's, let's, hey, if you're susceptible to that, you're susceptible to anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the thing, again, that scares me as somebody who wants to be facts-based or truth-based is you have individuals making decisions that have a tough time uh, really discerning between reality and fantasy. You talk about the American voters deciding. What is the state of this GOP in the House, given a lot of the dys dysfunction, the paralysis we've seen? What do you think this means for November of next year? I think it means a 20 to 30 seat loss for the GOP hmm. in the House. I, I think there's a real possibility that the House and the Senate are democratically controlled. Um, the, the presidency, though, it worries me. I think Trump does have a chance. I mean, if you look at all the dynamics and the odd things that are going on in, in America right now, um, you have this, this brand of unseriousness, but you also have people who will not change their message if they're in an R plus 10 district or above. If they're in a district that's predominantly Republican, they're not going to change their message. So you're going to get those same type of, I mean, I try to use a scientific term, whack jobs, but that's what you actually, you know, sort of get, you know, coming back into congressional seats. A lot of people are looking at your state of Virginia with elections uh, coming up around the corner here, and a lot of folks seem to be basing the future trajectory of Governor Youngkin's career on the outcome. If he can sweep the legislature, turn it red, does he run for president? Uh, I, first of all, I don't think he turns it red. No? So I don't think he runs for president. So... Uh, I'm just fortunate I get to talk to a lot of people, <laughs> but, you know, when it comes down to it, I think there's a possibility the GOP holds the House on the state side in Virginia, mm -hmm. but I don't think they do, and I don't think they, they, they take the Senate. So I think it's very possible that uh, Governor Youngkin has a, you know, House of Delegates and a Senate that are, that are really majority ruled by Democrats. Well, to build on that, if he, if he doesn't sweep Virginia red, there's a less likelihood that he would then jump into the race for, for presidency. So do you think that it is a foregone conclusion it's going to be Donald Trump next November. I think you're, you know, I was an intelligence officer, so you never say 100 <laughs> percent ever. Uh, but I do believe there's probably an 80 to 90 percent chance that he's in. And I think he's the presumptive nominee. 
And I think if they're going to be doing polling, I think if you look at the cross tabs and the number of people in the Republican base who believe the election was stolen, it's still above 70 percent, mm-hmm. might be closer to 75 percent. What does Youngkin run on? Election denialism? Wow. I mean, what does he do? And if you look at the House right now, you think a Mike Johnson or anybody in leadership is going to going to help old Glenn Young can get across the line? Hell no. Right. So I think I think they're going to be looking at polling and what the state of affairs are in the House, what the state of affairs are in Virginia in the House and Senate, the federal House and the state House and the state Senate. Mm-hmm. And I think really I think their polling and cross tabs are going to tell them it's going to be a tough run to go against Donald Trump for 2024. With your intelligence cap on, uh, we're told that this is one of the most dangerous moments ever uh, for the world based on the conflicts that we're seeing and certainly with what is breaking out now. In Israel, Christopher Wray uh, told congressional testimony that domestic terror threats are rising uh, along with this uh, global temperature that's going up. We don't know exactly what's going to happen even this weekend. How concerned are you? What's the gravest threat that keeps you up at night? Domestic terrorism is the gravest threat that keeps me up at night. And uh, but I'll tell you this, it's almost the perfect storm. If you look at Israel, I've been in the tunnels. I've been in Israel. Yeah, I've been in the tunnels. I've been in the north and south. I've been in the tunnels. Um, I've been in places that I think people would be very disturbed if they knew what was going on in Israel. Um, and if on you look which at side? what's that on which side? Oh, I mean, oh my goodness! Uh, it's, it's especially when it, when you're talking about Israel specifically and how easy it was to actually get through their defenses. Yeah. But now you know when you're looking at at Hamas, when you're looking at their ability to shield themselves using you know. Humans. I mean, I got to actually talk to Saeed Barakat. I mean, I was there. Like I, and I know really how they thought in the PLO when I was in you know Ramallah. But mm-hmm. I think I think we're to a point that with Israel, with Ukraine, with what's going on here, with the disinformation, with the fact that you have so much going on, even with sort of this bloom and white nationalism here in the, in the in the country. I'm looking at all this, and I think there's a lot of intelligence individuals that are saying, "Hey, you know, we have always have this chance for foreign." types of terrorism. But when you're looking domestically, when this all becomes some this rabid stew um, of hate and, you know, the inability to govern, if you throw that on top of that, how long it just took to do a, to get a speaker. Now, when you're looking at some of the bills that they're passing, I mean, you get to the point you're like, my goodness, there's so many threat matrices here. The courses of action are huge and you're going to have to stack that in some way. And I think that stack is very frightening, you know, to people who actually look at who used to look at this for a living.